News of the Times, Frightful Fridays, Tales of Women Killers in Ireland. Welcome to News of the Times. In today's episode, we look at three cases of error fatal females who murdered. Our first case from 1881 in Derry involves a ghastly violent murder that takes place on her husband, 80 years of age. The attempt to cover up the murder was impressive, but left bloody gore splattered across the room. Our second case is from 1887 in Galway. Mary Riley has been hired to nurse Michael Dillon. Michael has typhoid fever and is so weak he is unable to walk. The family awake to strange sounds as Michael is being cooked by Mary. A last case from 1902 Clonbrock, Queen's County, has Mary Daly, whose husband transports coal, so is on the road much of the time, romantically involved with a local farmer, Joseph Taylor. The murder that follows gripped the area and required the testimony of the children. Three dark cases of murder at the hands of women from beautiful Ireland is today's episode of Frightful Fridays. We hope you enjoy the show. Case 1. Elizabeth Buchanan, 1881. This case originally caught our eye due to the age of the victim, 80 years of age, being killed by his wife. David Buchan, an ex-soldier, is found completely butchered in his bed. There was reportedly all manner of gore around the room. Living in a lodging house, other lodgers report hearing what sounds like a gunshot. His wife, 40-year-old Elizabeth Buchan, reports that her husband has committed suicide. From the Belfast Morning News, the 30th of April, 1881, Tragic Occurrence in Derry This evening, an occurrence of a terrible nature took place in Fountain Street. It was reported to the police that an old man named David Buchan had committed suicide. On arriving at the house, the police found the dead body in a bed. The under jaw was wholly carried away, and the upper part under the base of the skull a shattered mass. There are two remarkable wounds on the face, one dividing the flesh of each cheek in the nature of a cut extending up to the eye. The whole place was covered with blood. The wife of the deceased said she was coming down the stairs when she heard the report of firearms, and returning found her husband dead and mutilated as the police have found him. Buchan was an army pensioner, and he was 80 years of age and palsied. He had been under medical care for some time. It will be a subject of investigation whether, in his condition, he was able to load and fire a pistol. The case presents some peculiar features which will be the subject of inquiry. The tragic end of the old man caused great excitement, and various opinions are prevalent which, for obvious reasons, are better withheld pending the coroner's inquest to be held tomorrow. A later telegram states that the authorities have thought it necessary to put the wife of the deceased under arrest. It appears that when asked with what weapon the injuries were inflicted, she said she did not know, but thought it was a pistol. The fact that the weapon was not about the bed was then referred to, and a search instituted. She then was seen taking a pistol from her pocket and shoving over a table said, There it is. The woman is something over 40 years of age, and the deceased was more than double that. She will be brought before the magistrates today. She alone was in the house with the deceased when the occurrence took place. There are real problems with the suicide narrative of events 
given by Elizabeth. The first question was whether David could actually have pulled any kind of trigger. He was palsied and infirm, and had been under medical care for some time. The second very obvious question was why was the gun in her apron pocket as she roamed the small dwelling ostensibly to try and find the gun that he had used and thrown aside after he had shot himself. The last question was the medical testimony. Were the ghastly injuries sustained in keeping with what would be expected from a gunshot suicide? Elizabeth is swiftly taken into custody upon the arrival of the police and the gun appearance from her apron pocket. Within jail and awaiting trial, Elizabeth firmly sticks to her story of her husband's suicide and her in innocence. From the Belfast Morning News, the 21st of July, 1881, The Fountain Street Murder Elizabeth Buchan was put forward at the bar to take her trial for the willful murder of David Buchan, her husband, at Fountain Street in Derry, on the 29th of April last. A wooden model of the tenement to which the murder was committed on the scale of one inch to one foot was placed on the table before the jury. The building is a three-storey house, each flat being let to one or more tenants. The apartments occupied by the deceased and his wife were on the third or upper storey and were approached by an outside wooden staircase from the back area to the second storey, and thence by an inside staircase. The first intimation of the death of the man was given by the prisoner herself to the police in the barracks in Artillery Street. People who lived underneath heard the sound of a pistol shot and came out on the landing to see what the matter was. Immediately they saw Mrs. Buchan, the prisoner, at the top of the stairs, calling out, that her husband had done away with himself and asked the people to come and see. Some called to go for a doctor, and the prisoner replied that he was dead. A man named Moore, who lived on the first floor, prevented his wife and other women from going up and said that the police were the proper parties to go if anything like that had happened. The woman, Elizabeth Buchan, then went down the stairs herself, apparently in grief, and went to the Artillery Street barracks and reported that her husband had done away with himself. Sub-Constable Dixon accompanied her to the place, and his evidence was of some importance. He stated that she went before him and opened the door of the outer room and he went in and saw the body of the deceased in the bedroom lying on the bed, the upper part of his body uncovered and perfectly naked. The body was lying on the left side, both arms extended in front, and lying over a stool beside the bed. The head was mutilated and bloody. There was smoke and a smell of powder in the room. Witness asked her, where was the gun or the pistol? She said she did not know of any being in the house. She would not have allowed it. He watched her while she went out to the outer room, and he followed her. She then came back to the bedroom and took a little leathern bag from a rail at the head of the bed and put her hand in it, but took nothing out. She went to the outer room again and returned to the bedroom. She put her hand into the pocket of her dress and stooped at the bedside. She took the pistol from her pocket and said, Sir, here it is. She handed him the pistol. He asked her where she had got it, and she said the fireplace in the outer room where she supposed he had thrown it after he had shot himself. Witness knew she took it from her pocket. He examined the bedroom and found a piece of flesh from the man's face lying on the floor. There was a great quantity of blood on the floor and on the bed. Witness went for the doctor after some constables arrived. Dr. James A. McCullough, dispensary doctor, 
who was called in by the last witness, deposed that he found the body in the bed, as described by the policeman. The body was cold in the upper parts, and the lower parts were nearly so. He must have been dead for an hour, possibly more. The head was mutilated in such a manner as could not be produced by a pistol or gunshot wound. The lower jaw was lying down on the breast, and the cavity of the mouth was a mass of blood and burned powder. The nose was destroyed. Part of the tongue was cut away, and the face was laid open on the left side to the eye, with the flesh hanging over it. There was an incised wound cutting the nose longitudinally and penetrating to the brain. There was a small pellet of lead found in the body which had fractured the second vertebra, but not broken it. In his opinion, the shot was fired after death. Witness saw a small hatchet or cleaver in the house, such as would have caused the wounds on the head of the deceased. The instrument was bright and shining, as if cleaned up recently. Witness made a post-mortem examination. He considered it utterly impossible that the wounds could have been inflicted by the deceased, or that any pistol shot or gunshot could have produced the wounds. Mr. McCorkle opened the defence, which was that Buchan died by his own act, having charged the pistol heavily with slugs, and discharged it into his mouth, thus tearing away the flesh and mutilating the face. He contended that, but for the doctor's evidence, there was nothing to support the theory of murder. Not one witness or circumstance to give colour to the case, and the medical testimony was strained. No motive had been shown or even suggested as actuating for the prisoner to commit murder. Dr. Sproul, who had known the prisoner long, deposed that she was of a weak intellect, but not insane, being below the average intelligence. The jury, after half an hour's deliberation, returned into court with a verdict of guilty and recommended her to mercy on the grounds of being of weak intellect. The sentencing is to take place the following day. What transpires is an argument from Elizabeth with her constant assurances that she is not guilty. From the Belfast Morning News, the 22nd of July, 1881, The Fountain Street Murder, Sentence of Death Elizabeth Buchan was put forward at the bar. The prisoner looked haggard, but was calm and composed in her demeanour. The clerk of the court, in the usual form, announced her conviction for the murder and asked if she had anything to say why sentence of death should not be passed upon her. Prisoner. I am not guilty, sir. I am not guilty, sir. I was rather kindly to him, too kindly to do anything on him, for I am not guilty. I am innocent, for I am not guilty at all, sir. I never done anything on him. His Lordship. Elizabeth Buchan, you were yesterday convicted by a jury of your countrymen for the murder of your late husband, David Buchan. And though you now protest your innocence, no one who heard the trial can have the least doubt of your guilt or of the propriety of the verdict of the jury. Prisoner. I am not guilty. I had nothing to do with it. I had no hand in it, his lordship. I can only repeat the entire concurrence, prisoner. I can get a good character, lord. I was kind to him always, his lordship. I can only repeat my entire approval of that verdict, founded on the facts that the evidence in the case, the jury could not have come to any other conclusion than that you were guilty of the murder for which you were charged. Prisoner. Your lordship, I am not guilty. This argument goes on for some time. 
continuing to calm her innocence in any gap of speech, the judge puts on the black cap and punishes her to death, although the plea for mercy was sent to the appropriate quarters. Elizabeth's sentence is commuted to life, and Elizabeth spent over ten years in prison before being discharged on condition that she emigrated from Ireland. Case 2. Mary Reilly, 1887. This case was famous in its day. Mary Reilly was a 30-year-old widow from Galway in Ireland with four children. She worked as a nurse to support her family. The local doctor who knew of her work found her to be a caring and able nurse. The Dillon household encompassed the mother, two adult sons and a daughter-in-law. 35-year-old Michael Dillon was suffering from typhoid fever and running a high, a very high temperature. Mary had been hired to help care for him and had been with him a little over a week at the time of the crime. The incident took place on the 23rd of April 1887. Michael Dillon, a farmer's son aged 35 years, is burned to death in his house at about 3 a.m. He had been suffering from typhoid fever for some time previously, and, and yet Mary Reilly was employed to nurse him. On the morning in question, the other members of the household were awakened by an unusual noise in the early house, and on going downstairs into the kitchen, they found Dylan lying dead on a fire which had been lit in the centre of the floor. And Mary really, in a state of wild excitement, throwing burning coals upon him. As the deceased was unable to leave his bed, Mary really must have carried him to the kitchen and placed him on the fire. Michael, from his long illness, was frail and it was supposed he could have been carried. As everyone tries to understand why this would happen, it is believed that she became temporarily insane from excessive drinking. On the night in question, all members of the family, with Mary, had gathered together in the kitchen, sharing some whiskey. The family members all went to bed at around eleven o'clock, leaving Mary alone with her patient. From the Kerry Reporter, the 7th of May, 1887, the alleged roasting to death of a fever patient in County Galway, the prisoner returned for trial. Today at the county courthouse, here an inquiry was opened into the appalling tragedy at Lindicane, where Michael Dillon was burned to death. The prisoner is Mary Reilly, and she belonged to a district in the suburbs of this city called the West. Mr. James M. Blake, seasonal Crown Solicitor, prosecuted. The prisoner was undefended. Winifred Dillon, an Irish-speaking witness, in reply to Mr. Blake, said, I am the mother of Michael Dillon, who has been ill of fever. On Friday night, the 22nd of April, she saw her son between 11 and 12 o'clock in bed and alive. Mary Reilly, the prisoner identified in court, was in charge of him as his nurse. She, the witness, threw herself down in a room at the other side of the house. Her son was lying in the room of the house next to the barn. This room is next to the kitchen, and she fell asleep after she entered the next room. She was aroused by a noise in the house. Mary really would not allow her to leave the room, for she threw coals of fire at her. At the door she saw her son lying on the floor with fire about him. The clothes he had on were burned away except for portions, one on the shin and one on the elbow. Mary really was with him and no one else. She held a bottle in one hand, which she threw towards the witness, breaking it. Mary really 
took up a pot lid of red fire and threw it on her son. She was jumping about and talking to herself. She had been in her house for a week. Her son was unable to leave his room or the bed without the assistance of two persons. Her daughter-in-law, Mary Dillon, was in the same room with her. Mary Dillon got up also, but Mary really would not let either of them in until daylight, and there was no one else in the house that night. Martin Beatty came to the house after daylight, and the doors being opened, he got in. She then got into the kitchen and found her son dead. He was 36 years of age. The evidence having been read over and translated for the witness, she said it was all right. Peter Faherty, servant in the house, deposed that he left the dwelling house between 10 and 11 o'clock to sleep in the barn, which is close to the room in which Michael Dillon was lying. Thomas Dillon also slept there. Witness was awakened by the screeching of Mary Reilly and got up and dressed. He went out to the back door of the house, which was open. He saw Michael Dillon stretched on his back on the floor in the kitchen, about a yard from the fireplace. There was fire close to him on each side burning him. His clothes were nearly all burned away, save a portion on one arm, and he was dead. Mary really was there with a broom in one hand and tongs in the other, and she was in a, a great state of excitement. She asked witness for a drink and said she would sooner have Mick Dillon back in place of the devil she was minding. Witness called Tom Dillon from the barn. He came in and both dragged the body towards the door. At about two hours afterwards, he went to Oren Moor for the police but was referred to Louth Gorge Station, where he went for the police. Thomas Dillon, who slept with her last witness, Peter Flaherty, in the barn, gave corroborative evidence of entering the house next morning when the whole affair was over. Dr. P. R. D. de Alton gave evidence to the cause of death. In his judgment, the deceased died of the effects of burning. Some of the burns might have taken place after death. He was in such a state previously to be unable to leave the bed by himself. He was such a man as the prisoner could remove from the bed. This closed the evidence and the prisoner made a statement that she would tell God's truth that Tom Dillon and the servant Fahati brought in a pitchfork to kill the man. His worship formally retained her for trial for the murder of Michael Dillon. The inquiry was then closed. The trial moves forward. There is no question as to who had killed Michael Dillon, despite Mary's contention that he had been stabbed by his brother and help. The question is whether Mary really is insane. The witnesses and the deceased mother, Wilfred Dillon, Winifred Dillon, were unsure. Tom's wife was also not sure if she was actually drunk at the time. The jury, however, were convinced, and Mary is found guilty of manslaughter, and deem that at the time of the incident, Mary was insane, most likely due to drink, as attested by the now empty whisky bottle which had been half full when the family members had gone to bed. Mary is sent to the Dundrum Lunatic Prison in Dublin as a criminal lunatic. The prison is the central criminal lunatic asylum within Ireland. Postscript Mary's testimony went unheard of in the court case. She was, however, interviewed within the asylum. Her story there was that she had been looking after Michael for over a week and she was exhausted. She states that Michael had fallen out of bed into the fire while she was deeply asleep.
When asked about details of the incident, such as how he ended up on the kitchen floor, she claimed not to remember due to the exhaustion she had been under. Her medical report from within the asylum states she entirely denies having entertained the idea that Michael Dillon, for whose murder she was tried, was a changeling, and states, as she has always done, that he was a restless patient during his sickness and must have got out of bed and fallen on the fire of himself, while she, having been awake as a nurse tending to him for seven days and nights consecutively, was in a state of profound slumber by his bedside. No one is convinced of her account of an accidental death, and legally she is condemned. Mary began her sentence as a criminal lunatic in 1887. According to her transcripts from the asylum, she regained her sanity and spent a total of four years in various asylums. In 1891, she was released with the understanding that she would emigrate with her children to Case 3, Mary Daly, 1903. This story commences with the discovery of the brutally murdered body of John Daly. From the Nottingham Evening Post, the 18th of June, 1902, Irish farmer found dead, supposed murder. John Daly, a farmer of Clonbrook, Queen's County, was yesterday found dead in a field adjoining his house. His head was battered in, and there were several stabs, apparently inflicted with a hay fork in his side. It is supposed that Daly was murdered. As investigations are begun, the neighbours are quick to point out the long trips away due to the work by John Daly and the growing intimacy Mary Daly was enjoying with local small farmer Joseph Taylor. From the Derry Journal, the 20th of June, 1902, Dreadful Murder in Queen's County. A terrible tragedy was enacted Monday at Clonbrock, Queen's County, situated between eight and nine miles from Carlow, to the right of the main road where the cross and a byway run down to the colliery. The facts are so far disclosed as follows. John Daly, a coal carter, lives off the byway. He is married and has a son about ten years old. Monday last, Daly was in Carlo and delivered a load of coal at Kilzig. He left town about half past nine, and it was remarked by some who noticed him passing that he was driving hard but not in the usual leisurely way. When he reached his residence at Clonbrock, he unyoked and put out the horse on the field at the rear of the house. His wife states that she remained up till eleven o'clock awaiting his return, and then went to bed and slept so soundly that she did not hear her husband arrive. She got up at seven o'clock and saw the horse and cart as usual, and later on she called her son to go for his father. The youngster returned home and again went out on the same errand by another way over the stile. He came running back and said his father's body was lying in the field, and then mother and son proceeded to the spot where Daly lay dead against the incline of the rising ground. When the police arrived, the body of the unfortunate man lay as stated, the back of his head in a pool of blood. There were some marks of a struggle about, and from where the dead man sank, there was another pool of blood, a yard or so, so distant. There was a dangerous wound over the right temple, under the left eye, and the back of his head was literally perforated all over by some sharp instrument. A fork with blood marks on it was found in the house, and further near the body a portion of a broken fork, whilst the missing portion was found near an adjacent stream. There were also blood marks on this second fork. 
A man named Taylor has been arrested and is detained in the police barracks of Dunane. Mary Daly is also charged with the murder of her husband, John Daly, as instigator of the crime and as accessory. With both Joseph and Mary being accused of John Daly's murder, a decision is made that the two trials should be held separately from each other. Joseph's trial takes place first. From the Nottingham Journal, the 8th of December, 1902, the alleged murder in Ireland. The trial of Joseph Taylor for the alleged murder of John Daly at Clonebrook last June was continued at Leinster Assizes, Marlborough, on Saturday. When the case began on the previous day, Mary Daly, the widow of the murdered man, was jointly charged with Taylor, but Justice Kenny decided that she would be tried separately, and the indictment against Taylor alone was thereupon proceeded with the accused pleading not guilty. The prosecution alleged that immoral relations had existed for some time between Taylor and Mrs. Daly, and that on the night of the crime, the prisoner, Joseph Taylor, who had been drinking heavily all day, went to Daly's house, and so maltreated the man in the presence of the woman that he died. Deceased's children heard the noise that was occurring and ran out into the yard, where they saw Taylor kicking and boxing their father, their mother standing by at that time. The evidence given on Saturday was mainly that of the police who inspected the scene of the murder and who deposed to finding the implement blood-stained with which it is alleged the deed was committed. Several spoke to the relations between the prisoner and the woman, and it was stated that while in custody, Taylor attempted suicide. The case was again adjourned. It would seem that the children had witnessed the whole of the brutally violent murder of their father. It is also shown that Mary, as their mother, knew this, as she saw the children witness the murder of their father. The children are then star witnesses in the prosecution of Joseph Taylor. From the Northamptonshire Evening Telegraph, the 9th of December, 1902, Queen's County Crime, A Boy's Tale of His Father's Death. At the Leinster Assizes in Melbourne yesterday, the trial was concluded of Joseph Taylor, indicted for the murder of John Daly at Clonbrook, Queen's County, on June the 16th. Mr Justice Kenny, summing up, laid special stress on the evidence, which was uncontradicted, that the accused had for some time had immoral relations with Daly's wife and that she had repeatedly asked accused to kill her husband, and had given him drink to do so. The jury, after forty minutes' absence, returned with a verdict of guilty, and the judge passed sentence of death in the usual form. Daly lived near the coal mines and earned his living carting coal. He was constantly away from home, and in his absence, Taylor, who was a small farmer, visited his wife. Mary Daly's son, John Daly, aged 11, was the principal witness for the Crown, and corroborated evidence was supplied by his sister, aged 10. The boy, a story as told to the jury, was that on the day of his father's death, Taylor was at the house with his mother, and he heard them talking in low tones near the fire. That night, the boy and his sister slept in the kitchen. He was awakened by shouting in the yard and heard his father crying, Leave me my life! The boy and girl hurried on their clothes and going into the yard saw, as young Daly declared, Taylor beating their father and their mother looking on. 
Then they saw their father dragged over a stile by Taylor and heard a noise as if somebody was being struck with a spade, and after that their mother put them to bed. In the morning the boy, acting on his mother's direction, went into the field. He there found his father's body, and his mother afterwards came, examined it, and returned to breakfast. The children were then sent to the police station with instructions not to say what had happened, but just that their father was dead. Joseph is found guilty easily and condemned to death. From the Sheffield Independent, the 9th of December, 1902, the Clunbrook murder, Taylor condemned to death. At Leinster Assizes in Marlborough yesterday, Joseph Taylor was indicted for the murder of John Daly at Clonbrook, Queen's County, on June the 16th. Justice Kenny, in summing up, laid special stress on the evidence which was uncontradicted, that the accused had for some time had immoral relations with Daly's wife, and that she had repeatedly asked the accused to kill her husband and had given him drink to do so. The jury, after 40 minutes' absence, returned a verdict of guilty, and sentence of death was passed. Mary's trial next takes place, but it is a foregone conclusion with all of the evidence that has been exposed in Joseph Taylor's trial. Much of the previous evidence is repeated, and Mary Daly is also not unexpectedly found guilty. From the Swindon Advertiser and North Wilts Chronicle, the 19th of December, 1902, an Irish murder, startling evidence. At Leinster Assizes in Marlborough on Friday, the trial of Mrs Daly for the murder of her husband, John Daly, of Clonbrook, Queenstown County, was concluded. For the same murder, Joseph Taylor was found guilty and was sentenced to death on Monday last. The Crown case was that Mrs Daly induced Taylor to commit the deed and gave him money and drink for that purpose. The principal witnesses were the prisoner's two children aged 11 and 10 and her brother. Mr Justice Kenny, summing up, commented on the indifference displayed by Daly after the crime and could not see how the jury could even reduce the case to one of manslaughter. The jury, after an absence of 55 minutes, returned a verdict of guilty with a recommendation to mercy. His lordship passed sentence of death and said he would forward the jury's recommendation to the proper quarter. There is no commutation for Mary Daly, and she is executed after Joseph Taylor by Billington. Few showed up to watch the execution. That concludes this episode of Wicked Wednesdays, Tales of Women Killers in Ireland. We very much hope you enjoyed the show. If you did enjoy this show, we would be grateful if you could like or subscribe to our channel. We upload five days a week. Mondays are murderous as we delve into the dark side of Regency and Victorian crime. Wednesdays are Wicked, where we pull together stories with a similar theme, such as Doctors of Death. Fridays are Frightful, where we look at crimes in a location such as stories from the stage to murder and scandal in the aristocracy. Saturdays is Serial Killer Saturdays, where we investigate serial killer stories from the past. And Sundays is a bit of fun, with a unique mini murder mystery where you, the listener, have a chance to solve a murderous riddle. On the last Sunday of the month, we offer a two-hour compilation of stories based around a theme. If you like this channel, you may be interested in our sister channel, Chronicle of the Times, where we offer a lighter side of Victorian and Edwardian news stories, as well as a weekly podcast of stories from authors of the day, such as Dickens, Collins, Benson and Conan Doyle. 
Thank you again for watching and listening. This has been News of the Times, and I am Robin Coles.